I'm going to keep it brief this time. Uh, Kai's going to talk about sugar tax. Uh, this is Kai's MSc work. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Kai. Thank you, Kai. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, once again, from Bergen. Okay, so cool. Um, well, thank you for the third introduction from Mike. And today I'm going to talk about my work about health and financial impacts of the sugar drink tax across different income groups in Canada. And um, so before I start, I just want to thank my co-author, my colleagues, Dr. Amanda Jones, Mike Coden, and Dr. Arthur Hema. And also this project is funded by the Paris Stroh Foundation. Uh, we prepared a report for them, which is going to be officially released in the after the new year. And they're hoping to use this report of results to uh, inform the federal government and hopefully to push some policy. Okay, and here's just the outline, and I'm just going to talk about um, the introduction of sugar drink tax objectives, model, the, my model method, some data I use, the quality analysis, results limitation, and the conclusions. Um, so obesity is a big issue in Canada. Over 60% of the, popu the Canadian populations are either overweight or obese. And compared to other OECD countries, um, this progress is ranked as seventh. So it's actually a really big issue. And it's also, um, BMI is also like increasing over the years. Um, so overconsumption of sugar drinks is definitely one of the a wonderful factor that contributes to this uh, obesity of the epidemic. Um, sugar um, overweight increased, increased risks of type 2 diabetes, heart and stroke disease, cancers, low back pain, and also other obesity related disease. Um, it is estimated to contribute to 382 million Canadian dollars per year on healthcare costs. So, um, World Health Organization recommends. Um, there are other countries that has this crisis to implement a sugar tax for at least 20%. Uh, such as the tax has been implementing in many countries, such as Mexico, the UK, some places in the, in the US, Berkeley, Philadelphia. And so far, there is a recent uh, system, systematic review that look at this real world evidence um, from these um, countries. and. It proves it shows that at least in short term, this tax is effective um, to reduce the consumption by 10 percent um, with a 10 percent tax, and also it could increase the consumption of bottled water. So it's been proven in real world that it's going to be effective, um, but there's still some uh, people argue that they don't want a tax, especially from the beverage industry. They spend lots, lots, lots of money to lobby, to fight, to put into a court to argue against the government who wants to implement such a tax. Um, one of the uh, arguments that we use is that this tax is going to be regressive, which means that the low income uh, family, the low income households will pay more, uh, more uh, of the tax compared to the high income families. So uh, they think it's um, not then it's equitable and the government shouldn't put more burden on people who are already poor. So it's important um, so it's important for the policymaker whenever they're making a policy they should try to consider the potential impact on health and financial inequalities. Um, in Canada there is actually a gap between low income um, and high income family in terms of their health. For example, um, let's look at the life expectancy. Uh, for female, the low-income quintile has two years shorter um, life, life expectancy compared to, compared to the high-income family. And for female, it's even um, bigger. Um, low-income quintile has five years shorter in terms of life expectancy. And some other examples, including like diabetes, diabetics, uh, the low-income quintile have almost double the risk um, of getting diabetes compared to the highest quintile. So there is housing policy in Canada, and so when we do a new program um, or a new intervention, we should take all this into consideration. So the objectives of my study is to look at the health and financial impact on um, um, inequality piece. And such a study has been done in some other countries, 
the modeling study, such as in Indonesia and in Australia. But the, the results are um, a little bit different. For example, in Indonesia, because the low, because uh, the high income family consume more sugar drinks um, than low income family. So after this text, the high income family in Indonesia will actually get more health benefit compared to the low income family. But it's the opposite in the Australian modeling study, uh, which they found that the low income um, family will benefit more because low income family in Australia consume more sugary drinks. So uh, the results is highly dependent on the context. So it's necessary that we do the study that's in Canadian context. So that's the objectives of my study. Uh, we're going to look at the health inequality impact and also to look at the distribution of the financial impact and see if this tax is regressive in, in Canada. Um, so in the base case, we look at 20% sugary drink tax. And for sugary drink, our definitions include all kinds of um, like from soft drinks, Coke, Coke, um, to like smoothies or like sweetened tea, hot chocolate that you got from Tim Hortons, and also um, juice, 100% juice. Um, we also think it's um, healthy and it should be taxed um, in uh, uh, it should be taxed in the contribute to um, sugar drinks. And the reason is that um, the Canada, the new Canada Food Guide has already said, oh, we shouldn't drink um, juice. Like before, they say juice could be used as a source um, to of fruit. But in the new guideline, they say no, juice is just as bad as other type of soft drinks, and we shouldn't be using, we shouldn't be consuming those. So in our model, we will tax all those things. And this tax is um, paid by manufacturers in the KD study if they want to pass to the consumers. In the base case, we assume they will pass 100% of the tax to consumers. Um, but in real world, they might decide to, oh, they want to, we don't want the price to increase that much. So they will maybe like absorb 50% of the tax. And some some places, they actually um, pull more than 100%. They actually increase the price more than 100%. Um, to just to, so they can make more profit or something. Um, anyways, and then the assumption in my model is that the pre-tax price is $2.52 per liter, and we'll compare the 200% tax scenario to a no-tax scenario. Um, so this model, um, we use it have an economic cost model, and this model is adapted from a previous established Canadian sugar drink tax model. Um, it's a multi-state, multiple cohort like payroll model. Um, and we pulled 2016 Canadian adult population in, in, and we use Microsoft Excel with adding tool. So this model is actually, um, at first it was um, established um, by a group of Australian, um, in, a group of Australian scholars um, with lots of people, like more than 100 people, they create all this. Um, the model for like the in terms of like the epidemiology and then all the model structure and it's being used a lot in in Australia setting to evaluate different types of um, obesity program or non communicable disease um, disease program to evaluate those uh, outcome and the benefit of using the same similar model is to that you can compare the results um, between different um, programs. And now we're using this in Canada, and hopefully in the future there will be more other programs that can use this similar model to evaluate other programs. Um, so, oh, do I lose all the animation? I think I do. Um, okay. There's Anyway, there is a picture behind it about the logic pathway of the model. Basically, uh, after the, the tax is implemented, um, we assume 100% of the tax will be passed on to consumers. So the price will increase, and after the price increase, um, based on price elasticities, um, based on price elasticity, different income group will react differently to the tax. So the low income group they might react more compared to the high income group, so they will reduce their consumption even more. And in this model, we also take um, uh, the potential um, um, impact on different beverages into account, such as milk and diet beverage. So we also have um, price, price elasticity for these two beverages. 
and to see maybe if they reduce the consumption of sugar drinks, they might increase the consumption of milk and that also increase calories. So we take all this into consideration and we'll get a net um, energy intake change. And with that, that can lead to change in um, re reduction in BMI. And once the BMI is changed, they will change, uh, reduce the uh, risk of this 19 um, disease and reduce the incidence. It will um, further down reduce preference. This is a specific mortality rate, eventually improve the health and safe healthcare costs. So um, the way we calculate that um, to is through a life table model. So the whole population is divided into cohorts by sex, five year age groups and income quintile, and then we follow each quintile from 2016 till um, lifetime horizon. And under the no tax scenario, we include mortality rate that I got um, from Mingate data. And we have the mortality rate and we can calculate over over the years um, the number of survivors and um, life years lived, and then we adjust it with prevalence years lived with disability, and then we'll be able to get um, disability adjusted life years lived. And so when it comes to 20% tax scenario, um, we change the BMI, um, the street consumption, the risk factor, and change the incidence prevalence mortality rate for each disease. So there, there will be like 23 um, disease um, small table um, that um, that take account of each um, change um, for each specific disease. And all this um, change in disease uh, all this change in disease prevalence and disease mortality rate will be used to inform the main life table. Um, will change the mortality rate um, and also change the disability weight. And then we'll be able to calculate um, what, uh, disability adjusted life years lived after our uh, 20 percent tax scenario. And so if you calculate the difference, this is typo. But if you calculate the difference, then we'll be able to get disability adjusted life years averted, daily averted. So um, this result is only for um, uh, adults because we didn't have enough data to look at children's data, uh, children's health outcomes. And other than daily severity, we can from this model we can also see um, sugar drink consumption change, net energy intake change, body mass index change, um, this is incidence prevalence case change, healthcare cost savings. Um, so for healthcare cost savings, we use um, um, we use a healthcare system perspective. We calculate cost per business case. Um, for um, cancers, we calculate cost per incident cases. For chronic diseases, we calculate cost per prevalent cases. The data is from economic burden of illness in Canada, and it's also just for adults. And for the tax burden, we calculate the unit price multiplied by um, annual consumption of the sugar drinks, and also the tax rates, which is 20%. And this tax burden is good children and adults. Um, so here are some critical parameters that I use. Um, so most of the parameters that's in the model are used by, um, are put there by Amanda. Um, these are the critical parameters that's different by income quintile. For example, like population. Um, population, each income quintile has their different sex and age structure. Um, like for example, like high income quintile has more male and the age is also higher in the, high, the highest income quintile. And we use, we use 2016 census data to get um, this data. And for beverage consumption, we used um, 2015 Canadian Community Health Survey Nutrition Component. Um, this is a national survey. We try to sample and try to represent um, the whole Canada. And they, they just um, they ask people to fill out a questionnaire about what they eat over the 24 hours period. And then we use this data to calculate the beverage consumption by each quintile. Um, and also the price elasticity, um, for own price elasticity, we use Canadian data, but for cross price elasticity, we don't have Canadian data, so we use Australian data. On um, BMI, we use 2013-14-CCHS pump, and we can find out that for female, the for female, the lower quintile has a lower prevalence for of, uh, obesity, but for male, the lower income quintile has a higher prevalence for obesity. And the mortality rate we use um, is Canadian Census Health and Environment cohort. So it's a data uh, that links, it's a data that link um, cancer registry 
um, census data, like a text form, and also their mortality uh, database. So we'll be able to look at the, their mortality by income quintile, by their social, um, socioeconomic status, and also look at the cancer incidence that using this data. Um, and obviously, the low income quintile has higher uh, mortality rate compared to high income. Um, so among all the diseases that was in the model, I chose five most important um, diseases and look and use the different data sources try to um, find out the different incidents um, for different income quintiles. So five um, most important uh, diseases, including type two diabetes, chronic kidney disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, colon rectal cancer. So this five diseases compared to all the other diseases, they contribute to the most of the um, health burden and healthcare cost. So, um, and we'll get registered by um, each compiler and apply to the original data. And um, some data with um, some data shows including NCAT, which I mentioned earlier, and Canadian Health Measure Survey, CCHS. Um, um, this, all, all this data is accessed through our research data center um, here. And so we do. For uncertainty, we do a probabilistic sensitivity analysis. We run for 3,000 runs, and five quintile uh, run uh, were run separately. And this reflects the uncertainty around price elasticity, beverage consumption, um, energy creation, and relative risks. And we also do some one way sensitivity analysis um, for um, like price elasticity. We, um, in one scenario, we assume all the price elasticity is the same for all the income quintiles. And this is the analogy we assume that um, under this scenario, we assume that all the um, this is, this all the incidence prevalence or mortality rate is the same for all the quintiles. And cat sum rate, we look at different cat sum rate. Um, BMI, um, in, the, in the base case, we assume an increasing trend for BMI. And in the uh, statistical analysis, we assume that BMI will just stay. Um, the same it will not increase and also beverage consumption um, in the sensitivity analysis we assume the uh, all the quintiles have the same beverage consumption and we also look at different text scenario 10 percent and 30 percent levels and then we use a concentration index to um, quantify health inequality so concentration index is um, used quite often just to look to, to um, look at um, um, social economic factors um, in terms of health, and so we can use uh, we can it can be visualized using a concentration curve. So um, on the x-axis is the cumulative percentage of income series. So the relative quantity percent is quintile one, two, three, four, and then eighty percent to hundred percent is quintile five. And the y-axis is the cumulative percentage of health, which we use is a voltage of life years led to major health in this study. So if the health is equally distributed, is equally distributed, then we will see the line will be like this green line there. Um, when the health is equally distributed among all the quintiles. Um, but this is usually the case, but this is just illustrative. So when the high income quintile has more health, um, the, 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 um, the concentration curve will be below the equality line. And also the, um, the concentration index will be positive. But when if the lower income quintile has more health than the higher income quintile, um, then the curve will be above the equality curve. And um, the concentration index will be negative. So bottom line, we just need to remember when the concentration index is closer to zero, that means the health is more equally distributed. So here are the results. Um, so you can see that um, the consumption after the, um, with 20% tax, um, it generally can reduce the consumption by around 15%, and the lowest income quintile has a little bit slightly higher reduction. And for BMI reduction, you can see that, um, first you can see that male has a higher reduction compared to female, and also the lowest income quintile has higher reduction compared to um, higher income quintiles. 
and we look at the, um, the dailies of rubric, um, the same thing we can see that male has more health benefit and also the boy drinking time has more health benefit. Another thing we can um, see from this graph is that so the yellow, which you, you can barely see, is the benefit that we can get from year one to year five after the completion of the text. Yeah, you can not see it. They're really small, and you can see six to ten years in that blue ones, and the green one is the year from 11 to 25, and then 26 to a lifetime. So one message you can get from this is that um, there's health benefit we need to we need to wait for long term to actually see it. Um, this is for the um, healthcare cost savings. Um, in total, it can save $10.7 billion um, for the lifetime, um, for the lifetime uh, horizon. And the same thing you can see the lowest quartile has more healthcare cost savings um, from a healthcare system perspective. And in terms of um, the tax burden, um, on average annual tax burden per person um, is around like $43. And with the middle income quartile has the highest burden, $44.3. But when we take um, income, their income to their considerations, uh, we can see that the lower second quartile, they're paying uh, the highest proportion of their income for this tax. So we can see that it is a regressive tax. And um, let's look at the health. Um, Health inequality. So business as usual is like when there's no tax and the construction index is zero is point zero point two forty eight. And when there's a twenty percent tax, um, the concentration index is slightly lower, it's point zero point two four eight. So if it's closer to zero, as I mentioned before, if it's closer to zero, that means the health is better distributed. And we can see that um, when the tax rate increases, the health is even better um, distributed. And the um, graph below is to look at the um, how regressive it is uh, under different tax scenarios. So it's 10%, 20%, and 30%. And we can see that um, we can see that the difference between quintile one and quintile five in terms of how much they pay, how uh, the proportion they pay for the tax. Um, out of their income is the gap is increasing when the tax um, rate increase. Um, so I did a couple of online sensitivity analysis. Out of all the uh, sensitivity analysis, um, these two are the most interesting finding. The first one is that if we use uniform beverage consumption, that means that all, we assume all the groups have the same consumption of sugary drinks. Um, the, Trend for daily is actually changed compared to the base case. And also for the uniform disease epidemiology, you uh, can see the trend is totally changed. So here in this uh, situation, we assume that all the quintile they have the same mortality rate, they have the same incidence preference rate for all those diseases. So we can see that it's important when we do this model, we have to look, we have to um, put, we have to take their um, health in health difference in consideration. Um, and also um, in the future, if there's better beverage consumption data, um, the results might be different. So some limitations of the model, the uncertainty cannot be used to compare results between different income contests because we run that separately. And also we assume that people will not change their income quintile over time. Like they enter the model in this quintile, um, we follow them over time, they will still be this in this quintile. It's a it's a big limitation because some people, um, young, the most young people in the lower quintile, but over time, when they get older, they might change their um, economic status. And another limitation is that the helping cat did not include age 19 and below. And also, um, did I use some of them uh, like self-reported? So there might be some bias in terms of that. So just in conclusion, the lowest income quintile against the most health benefit from the sugar drink tax 
Um, but the lowest income quintile, they also pays the high proportion of the income for the tax. And the higher the tax rate is, uh, the higher the regressive it is. So um, the results consistent with Australia's results. Um, so just in general, the um, will improve health inequality, but we will um, also increase uh, financial inequality. So the revenue from this tax could be used for to some programs that can further improve disparity, either health or financially. That's everything. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Kai. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering um, just about the process moving from the number of software distances to the you know number of poor health outcomes. Was there data on an actual change in health outcomes from a sugary drink test, mm -hmm. or was it kind of like we know how many people are consuming sugary drinks, we know how many people have these kinds of instances? So was it like did we do you use actual data on, on health outcomes from the other studies from the reduction, or was it more reduction in consumption of sugary drinks? Um, so it's like the the consumption changes the changes the BMI and changes the risk of all this disease. Right. And in this model, we can actually get like, oh, how um, how many, let's say, diabetes incidents are prevented over the years. We can't, I don't have that now, but like, um, we, so the, the tax reduce all this tax, uh, reduce all this uh, risks, and then we reduce the problems, uh, cases of let's say diabetes, heart, heart disease, and stroke cancer, yeah. and all of this um, can save lives and save them, have longer life expectancy. So I think, I think like the thing I'm wondering yeah. is when we look at um, like sugary drinks, mm -hmm. and we look at kind of drinks as the, as the substitutes, you know, you mentioned, like they don't start drinking more milk, so yeah. you have to take that into account. Mm -hmm. um, when I think of, you know, something like Coca-Cola, other substitutes I can think of, like wouldn't be drinks, you know, like maybe, okay, I'll drink milk now, but I'm going to eat a tub of gummy worms because I'm, I'm getting my sugar no matter yeah. what. And I'm, and I'm wondering about, you know, when we're looking at that effect, mm -hmm. I wonder if a decrease in the amount of sugary drinks consumed, are we consuming less sugar and less bad food, or are we are we substituting to these yeah. other kind of avenues that aren't, aren't necessarily soft drinks? Um, there's a study that's done that says the substitute diet is not huge and also uh, one thing they were taxing sugar drinks is because the sugar drink is like liquid so you can drink it easily while you can drink one two three just like you go out for dinner it's often as you can drink a lot of sugar drinks but then if it's like chocolate or like brownie which is solid food uh, after you eat like a couple you get full from that is more easily compared to the drinks so um so that's why um, um, they they might they might substitute with solid food, but they will not be as same as as that much as um, sugar. Sure, no, it's basically. Yeah. I, I have another question. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. Um, in terms of you know compensating kind of these the lowest income quintile, the lowest mm -hmm. quintile, having the hardest time to pay tax, do you have a mechanism in place for that? Do you have something? That you would, you would say, hey, you know, Canadian government, if you put in a sugar insurance tax, yeah. you should have this kind of sort of substitute. Kind of yeah, um, yeah, like people are talking about using the revenues, so like, for example, for um, fruits and vegetables subsidy for like low income families, or some easier ways to just do like rebates. Um, yeah, things like that that's been discussed. Um, but I'm not really sure if like other countries, are, like the countries that already have the tax, they're doing it. Uh, yeah, but that's definitely the way to do it, and that's also um, by saying that it's easier for the public to accept this tax. So that's something like I kind of, you know, we have a carbon tax in Canada. That's yeah. kind of work, but it's this rebate, and the average family might have received more money back than they mm -hmm. did, right? So you can see, well, you still have this incentive to reduce carbon and more save money. Yeah. But when I think of sugary drinks tax, it is the thing, like I want carbon so I can drive my car on television. But I want sugar because I want I want to consume it, and so when I think about a rebate to the people 
that such that you have more money than you pay in. So can you create an income thing where you think that it might seem more sugar than the other one too? Because they're richer now. They have and like, oh, you know, like. That's a good question. Never thought of it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Humans are complicated. Yeah. The, the policy that the heart stroke of interest in it is using that revenue to subsidize through a fetch. Yeah, and that's and, right. Yeah, and what they originally asked the Kai to do was to model that as well. Okay. So model the tax and then model how you could spend the revenue. And I said, no, we don't have time to do that. <laughs> this is a, this is a master's, not a PhD. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that's something that they're definitely interested in because it, it could potentially turn the financial effect from a regressive tax yeah. into a progressive tax yeah. if you, if you spend the revenue. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. Good job. Yeah. Um, uh, I have three questions about the monetary value estimation. Uh, estimation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that estimation, um, have the, the values uh, adjusted for, sorry, for inflation or discounted for? Oh, yeah. For it is discounted. Um, I just didn't. It's 1.5 uh, somewhere. I didn't, I didn't say it, but it was there. It was, it was half, <laughs> but it's there. It's, it's 1.5% discounting rate I use in the lab. Um, it's just based on the, the CADAS guideline that you use 1.5%. They recommend using 1.5% for the economic relation um, in Canada. Mike can tell like hours for that. Why is it? I can talk for hours about that. But this is Kai's presentation, so Kai, you can talk for hours about that. Yeah, Canada have guidelines on what discount rates to use for health technology assessments in Canada, and they recommend one and a half percent. Used to be five percent until a couple of years ago, uh, and they revised the guidelines. And I wrote, I'm responsible for this. I, I wrote the the uh, the reports on discounting that informed that one and a half percent discount rate. Previously, it's five percent, and it wasn't even uh, cited. There was no, there was no reference given, which is five percent. Uh, at least it's evidence based now. We can argue about the evidence, but at least there is some evidence. And did you do any kind of sensitivity analysis on the No, not, not in my. I didn't do um, sensitivity analysis at all. Okay. But it's a good question, right? Because because given that the benefits are very long term, yeah, you'd expect yeah. a higher discount rate to, to yeah. put smaller value. On any other questions? Just wonder, um, can you incorporate in the model age and age distribution? Yeah, um, we do. We do have, um, we separate the whole co cohort into different sex and age groups okay. um, and income groups. So for different age groups, we have different um, instance rates. We have right. different consumptions. Uh, we have different BMI. Yeah, that's all taken into Right, that's why you had a uh, looking at uh, the uh, income, mm -hmm. uh, and you had um, a lower BMI among women, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, there's definitely more. Like, it's kind of sad, but like when we look at just like the cross sectional data for yeah. five income quintiles. They're definitely more female in the low income quintile compared to high income quintile. Yes. Yeah. In terms of like, you know, looking at different income, um, I guess on this like, you know, it's obviously like we do worry about how things are going to fall. But something that's happening a lot in Canada right now is this, this lens for reviewing things from like a gender lens. And mm -hmm. The thing that I find out is, um, you know, I think about indigenous Canada and where this tax might fall, and how somebody arguing against it might say, "Hey, you're not going to tax one group of people more than another one." I mean, did you is is that kind of something that you do through an income lens, or is that something that you kind of look at separately, or is that something like we do with the politicians? You know, it's their problem. <laughs> but like like some minor groups, like indigenous. Groups? Yeah, like I, you know, I think yeah. about different. Different groups in general, but the mm -hmm. indigenous one is the one that really stands yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would say we actually discussed that in the paper that this study might not be um, suitable to look at the potential results for indigenous population just because their the context is really different. Um, their food, their vegetables, everything is much, much more expensive, and than the rest of Canada. And like we talked about before, like the 
code, like uh, even after 20% tax, might still be the cheapest thing they can buy. So in that case, they, they might not reduce their consumption because it's still the cheapest thing they can get. So in that sense, um, yeah, like indigenous populations definitely need some more help um, in, in this um, situation, but it doesn't mean that we should just put the drink, the, the um, um, soft drinks either. Yeah, some um, some people will say like use the revenue to improve the water quality. That's been discussed too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's Yeah, yeah. So some people will be like, hey, we should use this revenue to help um, indigenous community to get clean water. Any other questions? Think, yeah, just to clarify, Kai, um, yeah. well, great presentation. Um, but the this tax falls on the producers, not the yeah. consumer. Just thinking about indigenous, because if you do qualify as a as a registered First Nation mm -hmm. cigarette tax, you don't actually pay the tax mm -hmm. um, for cigarettes. Would that be the case for something like sugar tax? I know you were just saying. Yeah, so. good question. But yeah, I think it's it for different reasons for yeah. cultural reasons for tobacco. But yeah, right. but um, what? The, of course, they both have health consequences. So just you, know, you could make an argument. That, that's a good point. We didn't think of that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Your thoughts, questions, comments. That indigenous question is really interesting, and it's one that came up in, in High Defense, the external examiner. Uh, Stephanie Montesanti is an expert on indigenous health, and she made that point that on a, on a reserve, everything's expensive, but Coca-Cola is relatively cheap compared to, say, fresh, uh, fresh food and milk. Um, so it might be that even with the tax, it's still the cheapest thing. So people pay the tax if they indeed do pay the tax, and even if they do pay the tax, uh, they might not substitute away. So they're not getting the health benefits, but they are paying uh, the tax. Um, we also talked about this at the, um, this is Public Health Week, there was a panel discussion a couple of weeks ago for those, those who attended, um, and we were talking about those issues there. Um, that it's, it's uh, some people were saying, well, can you avoid this regressive tax in some way? Uh, you know, avoid it hitting the poor. It's like, well, you can, you can try. The trouble is if you do that, they're not going to substitute away from it and they're not going to get the health benefits. So it's really quite a difficult, uh, from an equity point of view, it's really quite a complex issue. You're, you're exacerbating income inequalities, but narrowing health inequalities, unless you reallocate the revenue in some way. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Do any, does anyone have a final question? No one online has a question. Yeah? You, you did mention that originally they wanted you to do the effect of a, a subsidy on yeah. food as well. I know you, you didn't carry out that analysis, but you, did you guys uh, come across anything on, you know, what's about the elasticity of if you, if you cheat the kind of good quality food? You know, and, and what are the health effects of that? Like if you get, if you get, if you get subsidy, if you will actually go buy it? Yeah, yeah, like do we, do we know, like, you know, if, if uh, salad was suddenly 20% mm -hmm. cheaper, would I be more likely to mm -hmm. buy that? I'm not really sure about the. I'm not really sure about the elasticity, but there's a study in the U.S. It's also like a modeling study. Uh, they do look at um, they look at different um, intervention they're trying to do to improve like health in the lower health and power. They compare different uh, they compare different programs such as like um, ban ban media about like distributed drinks or like. Like the tax, and also like um, food and beverage subsidy, and they do see like they are all beneficial, and if you combine them together, yeah, I don't know the elasticity if they're using the sugar in the model. I think I think that's really we got this revenue, you know, to use that to actually subsidize healthy food. Um, yeah. You know, and it has to be really. It's really good for families. Mm -hmm. make good food cheaper for people. And that's, it's on the field. It's on the field. Yeah. Another thing we talked about regarding the regressivity was a single price was modeled, wasn't it? $2.52 or yeah. something like that. Um, but one thing that we did discuss at the defense was that maybe those in the lowest income quintile might get their coke cheaper than that, right? Um, in which case, they'd be paying less tax if it was just a fixed like 20 cent tax. Uh, so that actually might mitigate some of the regressivity. 
Any final questions? No final questions? Fantastic. Okay, well then all that's left is to thank Kelly for a fantastic presentation. Thank yeah. you. Guys.